And if you're just coming in, we will begin momentarily as a few folks join us. If you're already here, welcome. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. All right, we will go ahead and dive in as people continue to join. Hi everyone, I'm Julia with Politics and Prose. We're live with Sarah Moss and Jenny Offill discussing the fell. You can find a link in the chat column to get a copy of the book from Politics and Prose. If you have a question for the author, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We'll move to questions in the last portion of the hour, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time to get to all of them. If you'd like to enable captions for this discussion, you can click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. We do wanna thank all of you out there for joining us. We're very grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. I'm so excited to talk about this great new book, in the fell, Kate is in quarantine and losing it. Stuck at home while furloughed from her job at a cafe, all she wants is a quick escape. One afternoon after a bout of claustrophobia, she heads to the nearby fell where she runs next to no risk of running into anyone she knows. Brushing out with no phone and without saying goodbye to her son, Kate is possessed by an urge to reunite with nature. Despite knowing the woods well, she suddenly falls and is immobile and you're injured on the forest floor. But something is off, and one wonders if Kate knew what she was doing all along. With equal doses of compassion and humor, Sarah Moss illuminates the different perspectives surrounding the pandemic, offering an intimate look at who we are when we're alone and how storytelling can be used to get us out of dire times. Sarah Moss is also the author of award-winning books like Summer Water, Ghost Wall, Cold Earth Night Walking, Bodies of Light, Signs for Lost Children, and the memoir Names for the Sea, Strangers in Iceland. She was educated at the University of Oxford, where she is right now, and now teaches at University College Dublin. And Jenny Offill is the author of three novels, most recently Weather, which was shortlisted for the Women's Award, and lives in upstate New York and teaches at Bard College. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming, giving a virtual round of applause to Sarah Moss and Jenny Offill. Thank you both so much for being here. The screen is yours. Great, well, I'm so pleased to be able to be here today and talk with Sarah Moss about her new book. Um, I've been a fan of her writing and um, it's always fun to get to hear from the horse's mouth about how something was created. Um, we are going to um, have Sarah read for a little bit first and then we'll go into conversation. So, Sarah. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here or at least not be here, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, I'm going to read from a section where we're hearing from Kate's neighbor, Alice. And I think all you need to know here is that Alice has been told to shield, she's medically vulnerable, she's a cancer survivor in her 70s, and she's also recently widowed. And she's living in this rather remote place next door to Kate. When this chapter opens, she's singing and dancing, but since I have no intention of singing, even on Zoom, you're going to have to imagine that bit. <laughs> she's also been baking cookies. Cookies. There's less than a minute between perfect and crunchy. If you're going to eat all that butter and sugar, it better be good. Not that she is going to eat all that butter and sugar. Maybe a couple after dinner with a very moderate spoonful of ice cream. It doesn't seem to have occurred to the government that the extremely vulnerable will be extra specially extremely vulnerable after months without outdoor exercise. Dancing's not going to burn off many cookies. She's going to send them special delivery tomorrow morning, the cookies. Ask Matt next door to take them to the post office and give him a few for his trouble. He can always use some feeding up. Kate keeps him on rabbit food. Not that they haven't been very kind, both of them, all the way through this. Doing her shopping when she couldn't get a delivery. And recently they've been walking on bikes, even with the milk and tins coming up the hill. The car insurance ran out, Kate said when she asked. And it's not as if we're going anywhere anyway. Only she couldn't ask them for the things she really wants. Salt and vinegar hula hoops. I realise you probably don't have hula hoops in the US. They're a particularly <laughs> nasty kind of potato chip. 
<laughs> and the expensive vitamins. Not with Kate working at shoots and leaves and growing her own lentils or whatever. Probably hasn't eaten a hula hoop in decades. It's infantilizing, that's what it is, having to have other people bring you food. At least she's not drinking, or only the occasional sherry at weekends. Have to mark the days somehow. Mmm, this is a good batch. They're so much nicer fresh. Just one more, the big one with all the chocolate. She'd probably be better go into another room while the cookie's cool. Or put the rack in the sitting room, that's a better idea, while she clears up. Newspaper on the coffee table in case of crumbs. Oh, but they're in isolation, aren't they, Matt and Kate? What do they call it? Self-isolating. One of those horrible new nonsensical phrases. Social distancing. Whoever came up with that? There's not much that's less social than acting as if everyone's unclean and dangerous. Though the problem, of course, is that they are, or at least some of them are, and there's no way of knowing. Medical distance, they should call it. And when did distance become a verb? Language is also infected. So Matt can't go to the post office tomorrow and the grandchildren won't get the cookies. And it's Matt's friend, not Matt, coming over on Friday with her shopping. Nice lad, turns out, though he looks, well, a bit dodgy really, hood up and eyes down, but she should know better than that to judge by appearances. I mean, appearances are a choice, aren't they? He could decide, anyway, he can take some of the cookies too. She hates the way they won't let her pay them or do anything at all, really. Very generous, of course, but there's a limit to how grateful you want to be, how helpless you want to feel, and she passed it a while ago. She wanders over to the window. How did she forget that? Poor Matt, and especially poor Kate. She'll be going mad shut up in the house. She forgot because it was just a text message, that's why. Because your mind and memory can't get much purchase on pixels on a screen, because nothing feels real anymore. That's probably why she's baking to make something that wasn't there before. So there's a new thing in her house. Making friends with a cookie. She's going to be befriending mice at this rate, like a prisoner in an old story. And it's the time of year, isn't it? The mice come in from the cold. Lots of people are getting dogs, worrying the sheep, leaving mess everywhere. Farmers fuming, though farmers do fume, their natural state. Too much time alone, probably, and no rest. But they're quite right about the sheep. She leans her face against the glass to feel it cold and hard. No one's touched her in months, not since she had that last lunch with Sheila back in March and they did the air kissing thing they learnt late in life. No one's ever going to do that again, are they? Maybe she'll die without ever touching another human. She realised at the funeral, in fact, standing there singing, that she'd almost certainly had the last sex of her life. She's come to terms with that, mostly. Sorts itself out when she needs it. But you can't hug yourself or pat your own shoulder. Well, the shoulder? No, doesn't work at all. Oh, shut up, she thinks. Pull yourself together. Here you are, warm and comfortable in your nice house with your nice neighbours, arranging with their nice friends to bring you nice food. And there are people dying out there, children hungry and women locked up with men who beat them, and nurses working 28 hours a day. You just shut up and wash up. Stop patting yourself. Put those cookies somewhere you're not going to eat them all. More Springsteen. There's a reason they don't write protest anthems about well-off retired people feeling a bit sad. But she's still leaning against the window, watching her breath mist the glass, thinking outrageously that at least the condensation is material evidence that she's alive. When she sees Kate coming down the garden path next door, glancing left and right before she opens the gate, striding off up the lane, hiking boots, backpack, no pretending she's just taking a breath of air or rushing to the doctor. I should stop her, Alice thinks. She's breaking the law. But Kate's moving fast and Alice just stands there, cheek to cheek with her window, watching. Great. Thank you. I think that's such a, a good passage to have chosen because it really sort of puts us right in the key moment, you know, that begins the events of the book with Kate going for this walk or run, even though she's not supposed to. Um, you have four different um, narrators, it, close third person narrators in the novel. And one of them is Alice, um, the older woman that lives next door. And then there's Kate and her son, Matt, both tell part of the story. And then later um, there's a divorced um, man named Rob who's on the search and rescue team. I was curious if one of the voices came to you first or if you always knew it was gonna be four interlocking stories. I think I always knew there were going to be several voices. I didn't 
immediately settle on four. Um, mm -hmm. And I started off with Kate, though actually I came to like Alice better. <laughs> Why did you like Alice better? I think she's funnier. Uh, I mean, Kate's not really in a state to be funny. She's, it's not quite fair to say she's lost her sense of humor, but she's, mm -hmm. she's on the way. She's, she's kind of losing <laughs> her mind. Um, and Alice is stoical and has seen it all before and mm -hmm. knows, knows what matters and what doesn't matter. I liked writing an older character. I'd done it a little bit in Summer Water and enjoyed it and, mm -hmm. and found it surprisingly congenial. I think I might do some more of that. Does it, is it feel like you can roam across more territory with an older character because there's more like memories and experience and. Yeah, um... I think that's, that's part of it. And there's something about, I suppose, from the perspective of midlife, there's something about allowing yourself to inhabit a voice 30 years on that's quite, quite liberating. I and mean, there's always permission to be slightly outrageous. Not that I've ever needed permission to be slightly outrageous, but I enjoyed it. Um, in the passage you read, there was uh, one part where um, Alice is talking about, um, well, she does this thing that I, I certainly noticed uh, happening everywhere during the pandemic, which was um, everyone was basically going through what by any standards was a historic trauma. Mm -hmm. But because we live in a world where we are, able to access through media and everything, the stories of people in much worse um, material circumstances. Um, it, had a, it had an interesting effect where almost no one I knew would acknowledge that something difficult was going on with them unless someone had died or they were actually working um, in a service or a medical job. And yeah. anything short of that, everyone was supposed to, um, I started to just see it in every, everything I ever read about the pandemic, there would be the little paragraph where it was like, it would say something quite terrible that had happened to the person. And then it would say, but of course, I, I, I live in a house and I'm not one of the unhoused who's on the street. Of course, I, you know, I have not good health insurance, but I am a able to uh, occasionally go to the doctor. And it was, it was such a feeling of, um, uh, it felt a little bit like being told when you're young, like, oh, there's there's so many children starving in other places, like don't complain. Yeah. Um, and it starts to feel almost like a tool for people not to express all of the complications of living in this time. So I just wanted to let you, you know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. I get quite annoyed about this. I think, it, I mean, you know, one is always lucky, um, but it's such a race to the bottom because you end up in a position where the only people who are allowed to complain are in fact dead and therefore not going to complain. Mm -hmm. And there were always disasters in the world. The world is always ending for somebody. So that doesn't invalidate smaller pains. I mean, we were talking before this started about how we both lost book tours to the mm -hmm. pandemic and we were both a bit sad and a bit annoyed about losing our book tours they're also necessarily mindful that you know book tours are not high on the list of cultural okay. artifacts that should be saved from covid um i think more seriously it's it's such a political move to tell people that they should just shut up and be grateful to be alive mm -hmm. and i think we saw that with political protest during the pandemic. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the idea that you should just shut up and get off the streets because, you know, you're still breathing, so what are you complaining about? Right. Serves political interests in a way that should make us very suspicious. And I, I mean, I'm in no way opposed to, well, in no way is an exaggeration, but I absolutely recognize the necessity of lockdowns and I followed the rules. But I did think that sometimes it is more important to be on the streets protesting than to be mm -hmm. inside worrying about a virus and black lives matter was the obvious example in the uk in the us but there were there were european versions of that sometimes the most important thing you can do is to put your body on the streets and shout no matter what else is going on so i think there were there are many problems with that that narrative of we're all so lucky to be alive that we should just shut up mm -hmm. but i think whenever there's something like that you should look at whose interests are being served by it mm -hmm. yes and i mean it it um I mean, I found personally that it helped to some extent to think of how much worse things could be in, in moments that were hard. Um, but I also felt um, 
as a, you know, I teach at college and I also felt like it was really, I felt like it was really hard on the students because they were particularly careful never to um, not acknowledge, you know, their good fortune or privilege, or whatever, but the psychological toll of it, you know, they're, they're 18, 19, 20 years old and their life had shrunk in a time that was uh, incredibly important to be around other people. But they also had this huge, as we all did, but this huge fear that just by doing normal things a college student might do, like gathering or going to a party, they might cause someone's death. <laughs> you know, And I feel like the psychological repercussions of that, we weren't really allowed to explore because if you explored it, it might suggest that you were saying, let's not care and shield people around us. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I, I tended to be very far on the side of, uh, reclusive, very tiny um, family group, but I could see how it, 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 there wasn't, it wasn't easy to have a conversation that didn't kind of blow up in that direction. Yeah. I think that was more, I moved to Ireland in the middle of it. I think that was more polarized in the U S and in the UK than in a lot of Europe. Yeah. Um, I mean, in Ireland, the lockdowns were legally enforced and Mm -hmm. it, it was just there there was no point in agreeing or disagreeing it was the yeah, law, yeah and everybody pretty much everybody was following it um but I, yeah sensible. both as a teacher <laughs> and as, yeah both as a teacher and as a parent i've been really concerned about teenagers and people in their 20s mm -hmm. all the way through this um and i still am yeah well i think that um you know i always think about the levels of adaptation we are capable of or not capable of. Um, I'm usually thinking about it in terms of the climate crisis, yes. but in this particular one, just the amount of uh, new ways of, new ways of greeting people, new ways of ritually doing everyone being outside all the time. It was, uh, it was really quite interesting how quickly that the handshake, which has been around for so, so long and originally comes from the gesture of showing you don't have a weapon in your hand, well, now you, um, do. you know, may have finally been killed, you know. I always hated show. that anyway. You never know if people have washed their hands. <laughs> so you're good to see that one go. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering, I, I think as a writer, one of the things that amazed me about this book is I just kept thinking, how did you write it in real time? You know, I mean, I, I find that I'm not, since you do, since it does take place during lockdown and the pandemic is obviously um, referred to um, in quite a few ways, I just wondered sort of about, were you able almost immediately to begin to see a fictional way to enter into it? Or, cause I, I felt quite stymied. I did as well. Um, and I didn't, well, for the first few weeks, I was really upset and I didn't write much at all in, we were in England at the beginning of lockdown and it was against the law to leave your house for more than one hour in 24, which drove me completely mad. I mean, I usually spend two or three hours a day running and cycling and the thought of being locked up, particularly by Boris Johnson's government was, was horrifying. And I mean, yeah, obligatory acknowledgement, there were worse things going on in the world than being locked in a four bedroom house, but I found it very difficult um, and I didn't write and then after a few weeks I started writing a not very good thing which served me well for escapism when I needed it but was never going to become a publishable book and then I just then we moved to Ireland and I just didn't try for a while um, and the kids were teasing and my older son said at one point um, I never said I was having an artistic crisis he said mum you're not having an artistic crisis you're just so obsessed by trying to buy a house that you can't write a book which I thought was rude in several ways and also not true. And then in ooh, October, November of whichever year it was, because who knows which year it was anymore, probably 2020, I reviewed some essays which included, well, at the time I thought they included several essays about lockdown, but actually when I went back and looked, they didn't. They included several essays with very small references to lockdown. Oh, okay. And that was the first time I thought, oh, we are going to be able to write about this. You know, mm -hmm. th this experience is going to make it into art and culture and we will start doing things with it. Mm -hmm. And after that, the idea came very quickly. So it's set in November 2020 and I started writing it in December. 
So I wasn't quite writing in real time. And the other thing is that I wasn't writing in real place because I was writing in Ireland and it's set in England. So I, I had that spatial distance, even though I didn't have the temporal distance. It was set in, I mean, it's real time and real place. But for me, they were imagined because I wasn't there. Yeah. And I think that that's probably quite important. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction. So it isn't sort of what you see right out your window. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think I was, I was just thinking um, all the elements of the pandemic from the most um, terrifying to the you know, smallest ones, how do you uh, greet someone on the street, et cetera. Um, I felt like because everyone was in lockdown, everything got uh, worried over and written about. And there were articles after articles after articles, um, at least like here in the New York Times about every bit of kind of minutia um, as well as the bigger things. And I felt like, oh, it's often as a writer, that might be something that you notice. You're like, oh, I noticed this sort of strange thing about like this moment in my life and how I'm, but I kept thinking millions of people are noticing the same, the same thing and the feeling of, or being told to notice the same thing. Um, so I think that it was, it, it's really great that in the fell you were able to, um, put in those kind of details, but because you set so much of it, you know, on that night and in that fell, it's sort of, we go into a more universal space, I think a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So did you know from the beginning that you wanted um, Kate to go into the, go into the woods and not get back easily? Was that? Yes, because I was, thinking, I mean, I was going out on bike rides and running and thinking what can possibly go, what, being hugely frustrated by the rules and particularly when we wanted to do was cycle around the country lanes and at five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't see how I could possibly cause any harm to anybody by doing that. But of course you can, I mean, you can always cause harm mm -hmm. by being in the world. So I just wanted to take that as a starting point, the situation where you think, oh, come off it, you know, this can't possibly go wrong. Well, it can, it, mm -hmm. it always can. Mm -hmm. And there were no actions that have no consequences for anybody else because we live in community. Mm -hmm. So that was what I was interested in. It, it was that, that kind of pulling of a string and then everything all the way down moves and actually, the decision to go for a walk when you're not supposed to, even though she's alone, there's nobody else around, the, the risk of causing any trouble to anybody seems very low. Nonetheless, there is a risk and trouble can be caused because, precisely because, no decision that we make is taken in isolation and everything that we do has consequences for other people. So that, that was really kind of the intellectual starting point for it. And uh, I, I imagine, did you always know that you wanted to have the search and rescuer? Person in it because you know that's the interesting thing when we imagine uh, that if we got into trouble somewhere you don't always immediately go to the people that would have to save you or help you or you know that sort of thing and yet I felt like by building out his life and showing us that you know he had a night with his daughter and this was a relatively rare occasion and it caused a lot of um strife you know in his family and and there's a little mention that it causes strife in a lot of people's families yeah that, that people quit the force by saying, oh, I'm not, you know, I keep being told like either you're home with your children finally, or you're, or you go to that rescue strangers all the time. So what does it mean to, to be rescuing strangers or, or holding down the fort at home? Yeah, I was thinking partly about volunteering. I've always done some kind of voluntary work. Um, I've always been quite interested in people's motivations for volunteering. I mean, it is not altruism. Altruism might be part of it, but even altruism brings us something. And for me, it's always been partly that I can just cope a bit better if I feel as if I'm trying to help or trying to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that means that I am selflessly trying to do good in the world. It means that I find the world slightly more bearable when I feel that I'm trying to do good in the world. It's still mm -hmm. actually about my feeling rather than any kind of objective sense of what needs doing. Mm -hmm. And 
why people choose the kinds of volunteering that they do choose. And I've done various kinds over the years. And actually, the, the thing I'm doing at the moment is probably more demanding than most. But you're always getting, whenever we do something, we're both getting away from something and going towards something. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's both an aversion to the thing you would be doing instead and a pull towards the thing that you're choosing to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's any less true of search and rescue than it is of anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing I found was that during the pandemic, there was a BBC show called Ambulance, which I'd never watched and I always thought was going to be kind of voyeuristic and inappropriate. And I got quite compelled by it during lockdown. And I didn't know why. And it, I mean, it's not voyeuristic, it's very nicely made, but I was a bit ambivalent and ashamed about my sudden compulsion to watch this show. Mm -hmm. And eventually I worked out that I was watching it because that's who will come and get you when you've completely mm -hmm. messed up. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes when things go wrong and people say, oh, well, she bought it on herself, it's her own fault. And I was thinking, how is that supposed to help? Mm -hmm. How is that possibly ever a useful thing to say? I mean, most of the worst things that happen to people are people's own faults. That doesn't make it better in any way. It usually makes it worse. And the reason I was watching Ambulance was because whatever happens in the UK and in Europe, you can dial that number and somebody will come and will pick you up and it will not cost you any money whatsoever. Mm -hmm. No matter what you've done, whether it's your own fault or somebody else's fault, whether a bolt from the blue struck you or you spent weeks scheming your own destruction, mm -hmm. whether you want to live or not, mm -hmm. you call that number and someone will come mm -hmm. and pick you up and take you to hospital or look after you in some way or find some solution. And I think that was such a reassuring thought, not because I was expecting to require the emergency services, but because it was an assertion of community and society. You will not be left. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, are, you are not abandoned, you will not be abandoned. And I, I mean, I know there's an extent to which that's nationally specific. Um, but it was that idea that there is, there is someone who will catch you that I really wanted to write about. But then what is it like to be the person who does the catching? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think um, there, there were a few particularly frightening moments in the pandemic where we were told like, the ambulances may not be able to come or they're backed up and, or don't go to the hospital. You know, it was like a whole period where it was like, don't climb a ladder. Don't, you know, yes. just whatever we you can that. do. And then the people I knew who worked in hospitals, um, I, my own version of, of watching ambulance was I started to read um, med Twitter, like people who work in places and what they were saying about what the situation was in, in their hospital in Oklahoma or their hospital and, um, in California. And it just created this sense to me because often they were begging people. They were just begging people, please not only follow the guidelines to keep people safe, but please don't do it. You know, we are so overwhelmed. We can't give the care that we want to give you. Um, and it was sort of this little, the little window into it. And I actually found it quite fortifying uh, by the time that I didn't want to you know, if I didn't continue on to be in lockdown again, I would think about that. And I would think about how I knew. And not everyone would necessarily know that. I just happened to know it because I had some friends who had sort of tipped me off that that was the place where these things were talked about. And it would help me think like, there's other people on the other side of this that my decision, it makes a, a lot of difference to them if I um, get into a, car crash because I'm speeding. Um, but on the other hand, I think there's just something about human nature that I think is is a very, the question of if it's your own fault um, is, I mean, this may also be kind of nation specific or whatever, but this whole idea of the sort of just world, um, which is, you know, to, to say it in the sim most simplest way possible, it's like, uh, it's the idea that basically um, you get what you deserve and you deserve what you get. And most people use it um, to shield themselves against the possibility, the actual true possibility that the same thing could happen to them. So I find it very difficult if, if you tell someone that a friend has cancer and they start immediately asking all these questions about how they live. I don't 
think that's any of your business <laughs> because you can also those things can happen to you whether you did that or not um and also, we all do it i mean yeah. if it's not as if we don't know how to live healthily we all know how to live healthily mm -hmm. but if we all you know ate lots of fruit and vegetables and fiber and ate no refined sugar and no red meat and never smoked and never drove too fast and exercised not you know exactly the right amount not so much we get injured but not so little that we become unfit if we all did everything exactly right all of the time mm -hmm. sure the burden on the health services would be much lower but nobody does that because we're human and there is pleasure in life and there are other things to do and you know we're complicated messed mm -hmm. up creatures about whom it's possible to write novels so I also feel like if you live long enough, you know the person who did do all of that and still got cancer. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? yes. so, so I feel like it's sort of it's sort of this wish to have control more yeah. than we have. Um, yeah. And and it's a series of sort of like it's, some of it is is common sense and some of it is magical thinking, and yeah. and and that was something that became so apparent like different versions of magical thinking became so apparent during the pandemic. I mean, obviously the most clear one is just the idea that somehow when you eat, <laughs> when you take a ma your mask off to eat or drink, that yes. the COVID says, oh, okay, if you you're hungry. Went, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I think that it was interesting to kind of see that embedded um, in the book a little bit. Um, now, I haven't read this earlier book of yours. I know you actually wrote a book where there was also a pandemic, but in that book, the people were quite far from it, like hearing the news, mm. right? So how did, was it, was it strange to be sort of revisiting like the, the idea of some kind of contagion after, after that? Or did this feel just of a total different order? It felt very different. I'd mm. almost forgotten actually that there was the, a plague in cold earth when I was writing this mm -hmm. it felt so so far away and so different I mean that one was was actually based on bird flu I think mm -hmm. and then the World Health Organization very helpfully declared swine flu to be a global pandemic on the day of publication which <laughs> launched my career in a very convenient way um I think the common point for me was thinking about the 1918 flu because I was thinking just because of the kind of reader and researcher that I've been, I put things in historical context. And it's it's interesting that you know, Virginia Woolf's diaries barely mentioned the flu, although it was raging all around her. And I was thinking again from the perspective of living through this pandemic, what it was like to live through that pandemic. Mm -hmm. But no, I wasn't, I didn't think much about cold earth when I was writing mm -hmm. this. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of extraordinary how um, what a dearth of literature there is about the 1918 influenza yeah. epidemic. It's strange. I mean, if you, yeah. and there's also, you know, so many people would die in a given city, but there's not a memorial that you go to in a city, like you might for a battle or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it, it is interesting. I mean, I feel like you're in the very um, forefront of people who are saying this time, even though we're still living in it, is eventually going to pass. Like, what of it can, you know, can I can I say what it was like to live during this time? Yeah. And um, but it's sort of interesting. I think it, maybe Catherine Ann Porter wrote something about um, mm. about the night, but but not very many people, you know. And and it's it's possibly because the desire after a you know a terrible time is is to move away from it. But if that were true, there would not be so many books about war. Exactly. Yeah. And there's no, so many thinking. books about war. Yes. So, you know, what's the difference then of like, why do people want to tell those stories? But this story, is it because it's a, you know, you have, you have this great um, part, I think it's Alice talking about how, um, you know, you think the apocalypse is going to sort of come and be very um, dramatic but instead yeah. it might sort of come in fits and starts and incrementally and and you might sort of just the dread might just keep increasing yes um you, yeah. know, you know so it's not cinematic in that way exactly it lacks plot and narrative structure and i i mean i also think that the pandemic is the you know, the lightest read through of what we're going to have to deal with with the climate emergency mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And some of the questions will be the same with diminishing resources, with when we finally recognize mm -hmm. the, the finitude of the resources, who gets what, and this horrible question about what counts as essential. I mean, in a lot of European countries, certain things were allowed if they were legally deemed to be essential, but essential is such a political category. Mm -hmm. And in Ireland, that became very clear when, for example, among the shops that were closed for seven months were those selling children's shoes because the purchase of shoes was judged to be inessential which oh. is fine except that for children yeah their feet grow and it was only when there were parents protesting outside parliament with barefooted kids that they said that sh children's shoe shoe shops could open by appointment to sell shoes to children wow well, i mean That's so parents interesting. Of children but shoes for children mm -hmm. um and they allowed elite sports but not elite arts and you could just you you know you, you could have constructed the makeup of that committee on the basis of what they deemed to be essential. It was nearly all men. It was nearly all mm -hmm. men of a certain age. Mm -hmm. uh, it was nearly all prosperous white men. And you could just see that absolutely mirrored what they thought was essential and what hadn't crossed their minds. Yeah, exactly. And we're um, going to have all this again with climate change. You know, what what is necessary is what's necessary to me as important as what is necessary to you. What do we do about the fact that thing different things are essential to different people? Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, the importance in any kind of question of, of equity and of deciding the essential mm -hmm. thing of having a range of people on that decision making committee, yeah. because it is we, we can all sort of be have tunnel vision towards what we is, is in our own life. But yeah, I know it did. It, feel, it felt very, um, very capricious. Like what was yes. I mean, certain things you were like, yeah, I mean, the, the one part that I thought was interesting was there was a brief period, very brief, I thought, too brief, um, where people were recognizing the work of people who worked in grocery stores and how, mm -hmm. what that meant to be stocking in a grocery store or cashier or whatever, which is a job I've, I've had at different points in my life. And I, I was just thinking, you know, people would, would tip or would, or would, um, try to figure out ways that they could like minimize the person's like need to be in the store. And, um, but it just went away. It just, yeah. it, it's like people just kind of got tired of it, I guess. It's the only thing I can think of. Or people would tip very, uh, as you know, much more than they normally would for delivery people, recognizing that this was a, a great risk someone was taking for, probably for your convenience. I'm certainly there were some people that couldn't go out, yeah. but, um, and it, it, it was interesting to see that light, you know, that, that, that like be uh, to illuminate that for a moment, not only the teachers who we knew were working hard, but what about the janitorial staff and what about the aides? Yeah. But I, I feel like that didn't, it didn't stay very long. It was just almost like a, and we're going to see that more and more with uh, climate stuff because all of the chains, like the supply chains and the things like that. Yeah. Yes. So um, did you feel like um, that you, I mean, there's several passages that sort of um, gesture in the book towards the larger like climate crisis. Um, it's done, it's done very um, subtly, but I, but was that, I mean, I feel like in the last few books that you've written, um, they've all dealt in some way with these sort of ideas mm -hmm. of like community and also like what what do we owe our neighbor? What do we owe you know th those around us? And and to what degree is it just about us and our little um, unit? Yeah. So did they feel of a piece with the last two books, like this one, in terms of some of the themes? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think it's a development in 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 literary terms. I think it's a development of Summer Water, which was a development of Ghost Wall. But I'm I'm interested in physical proximity and the idea of the neighbor i mean i was thinking about that in summer water and here what yeah what obligations do we have to the people who happen to be near us not the people we've chosen but the people mm -hmm. whom circumstance positions next to us in the moment of crisis and i suppose that's partly a question about about community you know can you make it does it exist how much do we trust the people we don't know how much can we trust the people we don't know? And the, I mean, the crucial and topical one is come the emergency, come the crisis, 
do we look after each other or not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think everywhere that I've lived during COVID, you could make a case for either answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also, I mean, as, as happens in the fell, um, you know, Alice has to debate whether or not, um, I think it's her, is it her daughter? Um, she's talking to someone who's saying you should, you see, yeah. you should report that yes. it broke. Um, and, and, and then that becomes a sort of um, darker, more sinister idea of what does it mean to look out for your neighbors? You know, yeah. are we also sort of reporting on our neighbors? And what does that, what does that mean? Um, because perhaps it seemed one way about people breaking lockdown, but it's the same mechanism that people of course use to report people that they are um, illegal, you know, illegally in the country, but might be flourishing and living a lovely life, you know, that, that if they weren't being kind of reported on. Um, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, and in Europe that had such such political resonance. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole, I mean, in, in the UK, they set up police, hot, well, in England anyway, they set up police hotlines for people to report their neighbours for breaking lockdown. And in mm -hmm. Ireland, they would never have done that. And there was no mm -hmm. gesture towards it. There is no culture of yeah. dobbing in your neighbour. Yeah. Um, and of course, most of the people who used it in England were using it maliciously because they'd right. been in conflict for years. It was very rarely. They've been anyway. waiting for that hotline for their whole life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But if you think about what was happening in Austria and Germany in the 30s and 40s, where people were using hotlines to report people yeah. or, you know, in communist Better, in the yeah. 80s and 90s, there's a really bad political smell around that. And a lot of people wouldn't go anywhere near it. Yes. I mean, it's it's. It, it felt very, they, they also had that here very much after 9-11, there would be these signs everywhere um, that, that were quite ominous that said, if you see something, say something. And it was yes. just the incredible vagueness of yes. both of those somethings. Yes. Um, and the way, of course, it was like almost always used to target, um, you know, an, anyone in society that was not already in power, you know? Absolutely. So it was, it was yeah. very, and we, there's still signs that say that. You know, in, oh, it's in, chanted now on British trains and at stations. If you see something that doesn't look right, tell us, see it, say it, sort it, and it, it you know, it's broadcast it, sort of. every... That's the hilarious British part of it. See it, say it, sort it. Yes, <laughs> but it, it's broadcast every fifteen minutes on all trains and stations. That you know, you just hear it the whole time. That's why I can recite it. You, you hear yeah. it the whole time. I just we left out the sort it for sure. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's the funny part. Um, well, I want to be sure we have some time to take uh, the questions from the audience, but is there any um, any other, should I, uh, well, I can come back and ask you a, a question after we do a few more here. Okay, um, let me go into the chat. Um, okay, uh, we have someone writes, I love the descriptions of pandemic cravings and baking. Did either of you pick up a habit or hobby that has stuck with you throughout the past two years? Ooh, that's an interesting question. No, um, I've always baked anyway. I've been doing sourdough for years, mostly because the bread you can buy in England is so awful that you, <laughs> you know, if you want decent bread, you make your own. And certainly if you want decent bread on a scale to feed teenagers, you make your own. Um, I did briefly pick up roller skating um, <laughs> when we were in Dublin, there were seven months in which we weren't allowed to go more than five kilometers from home. And we all got slightly desperate. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was roller skating. skating. Yeah, I was roller skating around the pier in the dark in <laughs> November and December, but I passed the roller skates on to a teenage friend. And that was the end of that. Um, our version was that uh, in what I thought of as deep pandemic, uh, we ordered a ping pong top that could go on our we just sacrificed our table our eating table and we had ping pong on it so that there was something we could do because it was the dead of winter and it yeah. was, we were all uh you know going a little a little bonkers um being inside and and so we played some ping pong um but the only other habit i'd say i've, I've picked up from that i didn't pick up baking sadly although my parents did um is i i picked up doing um word games, which I hadn't done before. Um, and we certainly did more um, puzzles, things like that, which are, you know, just board games, things of that nature that were kind of had been relegated for some years, you know, yeah. that the, they got dragged out again. Um, so that was interesting. Let's see. Um, I'm so struck by that comment on minutia. 
what tiny details of pandemic life were your must haves for Kate's living situation? Well, Kate's living in quite a distinctive situation. She's in a small house on the outskirts of the village up a hill in the Peak District. And I think one of the aspects of life that became much more important in lockdown was exactly where you lived, because when we were all limited to a very small radius, mm -hmm. suddenly your immediate environment was, was your entire world. So my new show. I suppose the complexities of getting food, actually. I mean, Kate has very little money. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I noticed was the way everything became a moral decision. I mean, it used to be that if I was in the middle of cooking and I realised that I needed an extra chin of tomatoes, it was just a matter of giving a child 50 pence and saying, please go around the corner and get some tomatoes. Oh, all right, here's an extra 30 pence, get yourself some whatever. You know, it, it was just a matter of incentivizing the child to go around the corner and buy whatever it was I needed. Um, and come the pandemic, there was this thing about, you know, is your purchase worth killing a granny for? The idea that- you the actual just, yeah, the, the idea that you, you know, the fact that you ran out of garlic in the middle of cooking dinner was going to be responsible for somebody's death and mm -hmm. you should just do without it. And it was your own stupid fault. And then, you know, if you did go to the yeah. shop, you should buy everything you could ever need. Mm -hmm. And you can only do that if you have enough money on any given occasion to buy everything you could ever need and enough space to store it. Right. So I suppose for Kate, it's that shift between being able to buy the food as she needs it or as she can afford it and the the way it becomes a moral issue if she needs to buy something else and also that she loses the leftovers from the cafe which she'd used to was depend on a big help yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i think that, that that was um so many of the things that you were asked to do um were helpful if you could do them but for some people they were really out of yes they, they were just not within possibility whether it was staying home a lot of people had jobs that they couldn't not go to. But even once the vaccines came around, at least in America, there wasn't uh, a lot of people weren't um, paying people to, if they took off work. And so it could be for someone living really close to the line, it could be a really hard decision. Like they, they wanted to get the vaccine, but they would have had to go and wait in line halfway across the city and, you know, lose their wages for that day. So, you know, everything that, that, within a certain level of, of um, just income feels like, okay, that's an obvious decision is mm -hmm. so much less obvious. I think when um, you take it down a few levels of like, how close are we to the, to the edge, you know? Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was very, actually, in, certainly in England, that went the opposite way because the government stepped in and did things that you could never imagine a Tory government doing. I mean, they took over paying the wages for companies so that people could stay home. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't coming from any good place. They're still a Conservative government. But one of the weird things was that in quite a few countries, these traditionally right wing governments were suddenly behaving in unimaginably left wing ways. I mean, is that I know. Right well, we had a little of that, too. I mean, we, we yeah. had we got some payments. I I think one of the things that was interesting to me to go back to a little bit to thinking about the climate crisis, too, was um, one of the things when you are doing any kind of activism about climate is, well, we can't stop the plane. We can't stop yes. the train. We can't give people a universal living wage. These things are impossible. And then it just wasn't impossible for this yes. brief moment. And it was very, it, it was, it was strange because you just realized like it was done very quickly. Like, like when there was a will to do it, it was done very quickly. Yes. Um, and also because the justification wasn't just about like, uh, food and housing and blank is a human right. It was about uh, national security. And we always, you know, the conservatives can justify th that much more easily. I thought it was when there was an illness that threatened the rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Although they quickly figured much out. Much less. Than, but yes, yeah. in the beginning, especially before there were yeah. anything. Um, let's see. Um, what are your students most anxious and or excited about as things become safer? Um, I guess we can both answer that. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting to see how different the answers are. Go on. Um, I think that my my students are just happy to be able to um, have some of the 
like say if they're a senior that actually getting to have um, a senior show, you know, you know, if you're an artist or having a, a performance. Um, and then I think being able to, their, their desires are quite small, really, you know, being able to get a few of your friends together and actually have a party for your birthday, you know, at a restaurant or something. These things feel like a big deal. I don't hear them like clamoring to have giant house parties or anything. It's just, it, it's just the idea that you would, um, or that you would be able to go and visit your family when you wanted to, you know, that sometimes it's, it's, it's something like that. Yeah. yeah. But that's exciting. I think mine are, so you can hear some students shouting in the background, possibly I can. Um, I think mine are so pleased and excited just to be able to sit in a room with each other and talk mm -hmm. again. I mean, universities were completely closed for over a year in Ireland, everything was online. Mm -hmm. So the, the absolute joy of just being able to gather in a room and, and talk is is quite astonishing they're beginning to look forward to traveling again as am i uh, well you know nuclear meltdown permitting um yeah i think there's just a very tentative sense that that pleasure might be permitted again on a small mm -hmm. scale yes but i i think that i that, that's so true just the fact that you're in a room together mm -hmm. after the zoom teaching and and the the difference of that i was i was sort of stunned at how happy they were yeah. um and and how especially in the beginning how everyone how engaged everyone was because yes. they were just there were still only a few of the classes were being taught in person and the the professors had to agree to do it i did it in a tent because i didn't want to do it in a, but so that we all sat in this quite cold tent with masks on it was quite hard to hear yeah but it was a really good class they were you know they were really engaged and they were really thoughtful and um you know, because we'd been doing the Zoom thing, which is was a whole nother kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, okay, I think we have uh, one more question here. Um, when do you like to be completely alone? And when do you like to communicate and collaborate with others? Mm, that's interesting. I like both. I think I'm very lucky as both a writer and teacher that I, I like both. Um, and I can never decide if I'm an introvert or an extrovert because I, I don't do very well without human contact, but I also don't do very well without solitude. So, I mean, I guess that's the spectrum and I'm, I'm in the middle. Um, I really, for years I enjoyed, and I think depended on a kind of loose rhythm of days alone to write days on campus teaching. Mm -hmm weeks of travel and weeks of being at home and it just I, I liked that I mean it wasn't ever really a pattern but mm -hmm. I liked that that back and forth and I'm beginning to get it back again now the travel's starting again and sometimes there are days when there is nobody but me in my house again I, I really missed that I mean I'm used to being the one who works from home um, but that was the one who works from home not one of four working from home yep. on the same yep. wi-fi and you know and there were days in lockdown when there was always somebody truffling about in the kitchen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just infuriate. I could hear them the whole time. <laughs> there was never a moment when there was not somebody rummaging a cupboard and mm -hmm. going through the fridge. And I, it really annoyed me. I want to be the only one doing that during the day. <laughs> yeah, I do feel like uh, I, I finally had a, a weekend um, by chance, really, where I was alone in the apartment for two days. And it it was so unfamiliar, but also yes. thrilling. Yes. Um, you know, I'm alone sometimes in my car driving somewhere. And now I'm, but now that we're back to school last year, we didn't, we couldn't go to offices, you know, you, you didn't. Yes. and so I go to my office sometimes, but, um, but it's true. It's like, I, I feel like, um, I'm just a much crankier person. If I don't yeah. get some solitude, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the main difference. It's like, yeah. I don't want to be alone all the time, but if I don't get it, I sort of fray around the edges because yes. I don't feel like I can think really yeah. I'm not alone, at least certainly not think in any way that has to do with writing. Yeah, I'm not one of those people who can write in a cafe with lots of busyness around. Oh, I can and do. I really like doing that, but there's a difference between writing in a cafe full of strangers and trying to write in a house where people keep doing things yeah, yeah <laughs> I know you hear, you hear about some some of those women writers that could just sit at the kitchen table I don't know if it was like 
Alice Monroe or Grace Paley or something, but I, I've never been one of those. I have to have a door that closes. <laughs> so great. Um, let's see. I think we, oh, okay. I think we have um, two new ones and then we'll, we should. Yeah, there's time for whichever questions you want to leave with. Okay. Let's see. Um, Was there a moment during the pandemic that you heard or read a perspective that surprised you, a frontline worker, child creator, et cetera? Were you inspired by any firsthand stories that made their way into your writing? I have, I lived with postgraduate medical students when I was doing my PhD. So quite a lot of my friends are doctors and I found a lot of what they had to say moving and memorable, not because they were giving first-hand accounts of COVID wards, although in some cases that was true, but because of how persecuted they felt by the narrative of them as heroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was particularly the case in England where we have the National Health Service. And I think a lot of them, there was clapping every Thursday night, which I didn't like at all. It had a kind of fascist air about it to me. And so many of my friends who were medics said that what they wanted was safe working conditions not to be told that they were heroes you know that they they hadn't signed up to be heroes they'd signed up to do their jobs mm -hmm. and i think the more we i mean we know about this from the you know, from feminist thinking about the virgin and the whore the more you require people to be heroes the more pressure you put them under mm -hmm. not to be human mm -hmm. and i think the way we treated healthcare workers was indecent and mm -hmm and inhumane, precisely because we kept telling them how wonderful and heroic and superhuman they were, and nobody should be required to be superhuman. And at least in America, many of them had a combination of being, um, you know, there'd be the signs, heroes work here or whatever that the corporate offices had put up, but they also might be, um, be attacked by like anti-vaxxers or they, you know, there that was, wasn't there was issue a, a truly extreme, you know, of, lashing out at them in some parts of the country. And so it was, you know, they were sort of like, we don't need to be either of these things. Like we're not, we, you know, we don't need you to deliver pizzas. We don't need you to whatever, like, thank you. But what we want is just everybody just follow the rules and see if we can, um, you know, flat the curve, like we talked about in the early days. Yeah. So for me, I guess one perspective that um, I realized I did, it was something that I hadn't thought about is um, I, I have a friend who's chronically ill and who often um, you know, could not attend events because it's kind of a cyclical illness. And, and, and one of the things she was saying was that as part of the um, community of people who had like mobility issues, that actually all the Zoom stuff was for the first time an ability to participate as you, as you wished, you know, and, and be able to, whatever your energy level was, you could, and, and so, you know, people would complain so much about Zoom, but it was interesting to realize like for some people, and, you know, I might miss going to a book festival, but it's nice when you do these Zoom conversations that people can come from wherever they are without having to, you know, get across this as a city to, um, you know, see an event. So, I mean, I felt like there were, that was kind of a perspective that I I missed um, yes. and it, it was, really interesting to think about. Um, well, I think we're we're at the end. So um, I'm gonna turn things back to politics and prose, but I just wanna say thank you so much, um, Sarah, for sharing your you. thoughts with us. And it was a real pleasure to get to talk about the film. Thank you. Um, our esteemed thanks on behalf of politics and prose, the two of you, what a fascinating and lovely conversation. Um, we do have one bonus question, if we can beg of you. Um, because we're booksellers and we have such great authors with us, um, we would love to hear at least one book that's on your nightstand, something you're reading, fiction, nonfiction, um, in addition to going and grabbing our copies of The Fell, what other books should our readers be aware of? Mm. Um, I have a book, I'm, I'm trying to figure out when it's coming out. I think it's coming out really soon. It's called um, A History of Present Illness by um, Anna DeForest. And it is by um, a woman who, it's a debut novel, um, who's also, a, who's become a doctor, neurologist. And it's it's a really interesting, like 
look inside at what it is to do the rounds. And it isn't specifically about COVID. It's more about what that world is to go from being a medical student on, but the writing in it is just really um, strange and beautiful. So that would be a recent recommendation for me. I we, I always like Miriam Tove's work very much and she has a new, well, it's, it's not yet out in the UK, but I think it probably is in the US, a new novel called Fight Night, which I, mm. I liked. Yeah, that is out here. I have it. It's great. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Um, and I think uh, I think a history of present illness will be out in um, yeah in the next month or two so soon. Okay. Great. Um, thank you both for those suggestions. I'm going to suggest to our audience out there that they follow the link in the chat to get their copy of the Fell to read first. Um, you can find the link there, or just visit us online at politics-pros.com and don't hesitate to check out the rest of our events calendar for everything else coming up. Um, until then, our sincere thanks again to author Sarah Moss and Jenny Offill. Um, thank you so much for being with us and to everyone out there, continue to stay safe, stay strong, and of course, stay well read. And we